Okay, welcome back. So today we're going to wrap up our discussion of hashing, and then I'm going to introduce you to, or we're going to sort of delve a little bit more deeply into um, one of the features of Java that we haven't talked about very much this semester, we don't usually talk about in CS125, but you guys are doing so well this semester that I feel like we can at least, you know, introduce you to this idea, which is the J Java generic system. So this is a feature of Java that allows us to um, get the best of two of the other features of the language, one being polymorphism. So we've already seen as we've designed classes like our linked list class, like our various list classes, like the hash table that we built last time, that the fact that every Java object inherits from this object superclass makes it possible to write a general purpose list that can store any type of Java object. So that's pretty cool. Um, however, you might have noticed as we were doing this that in doing that, we have sort of left behind some of the features of Java's type system that we might want to preserve. So by writing classes that can store Java objects and upcasting those objects to insert them into those collections or those classes, uh, we're losing type information that the compiler uh, would normally be able to use to allow us to make sure that we're doing that safely. So today we're going to talk about generics, which is something that allows us to do both things, right? And it's pretty cool as well. It's also something that you're going to see in Java documentation um, and, you know, in some of your own code. You've already started to use this in terms of when you've used hash maps or array lists for the MPs or the homework problems, you've started to have to provide these type parameters, but today we're going to show you how those type parameters actually get used inside a real class. But I want to um, start by wrapping up our discussion last time, because this stuff's sort of too cool to just let fall off the end of last lecture. So toward the end of last time, we had introduced a modification to our original hash function that we called a cryptographic hash function. So what we did is we took these three original properties that we wanted of a hash function. One was determinism, the second one was uniformity, the third one was efficiency. We dropped the efficiency requirement. So for a cryptographic hash function, we're actually going to want this to be at least somewhat difficult to compute. And there's a reason for this. And then we add a couple of other properties. So the first thing is, for a cryptographic hash function, if I give you the hash, you should not be able to easily compute the input that I use to generate that hash. And this is a, this is a property that's really important, particularly in cryptographic applications, and we'll see why in a minute. Now, you can start trying all the different inputs until you find the right output, but that's not, that, that will work if you have, you know, years and years of time, but that's not something we consider to be a feasible way of doing this. So you shouldn't be able to do this quickly. All right, second thing is, a small change in the input produces a huge change in the output. And this is sort of connected to the first property. The idea is that if the, Im if the output doesn't change with a small change to the input, then when you find a hash that's close to the value that you're looking for, you know that your input is close to the value that you're looking for. We don't want that. That would violate our first property. So a good cryptographic hash function, even if I change one bit in the input, the hash value is essentially kind of completely random again. It just jumps to a completely new part of the hash space. And the final requirement for a cryptographic hash function was that it's difficult to compute, not easy. We'll see why in a minute. So a, prop, a function that, that uh, fulfills these properties is known as a cryptographic hash function. There are a bunch of these out there in the world. You'll start to maybe see them sometimes. Um, there's one called MD5 that's not used very much anymore because it has some weaknesses. There's a new family of these that are called SHA, so there's SHA1, SHA2, I think there's SHA3 now as well. Um, the, I don't know why they're referred to in, in this way, but you'll, you'll see some of these acronyms around, and that's what people are referring to, as a specific instance of a cryptographic hash function. So where we, right around the time we left off, we talked about this example of password checking. And I want to kind of go through this again and then uh, point out some of the limitations to this. So, you know, there's this problem when you log into websites, which is you have to provide a password. But for security purposes, you really don't want the website to store your password in plain text. Because that means if, and I shouldn't say if, it just seems to be a matter of when. How many people saw that Quora just uh, released the fact that they were 
hacked the other day and released a bunch of like 100 million records. And I'm thinking, I'm so happy I've never signed up for Quora, right? You go there and like, you, you, you look for an answer and then as soon as you browse to another, um, another question, they're like, create an account. And I'm always like, no, 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 no thanks, right? So I, I feel good about that now. Um, but anyway, uh, so, so yeah, there's, these, these things happen. There are security breaches out there in the world for a variety of reasons. Um, if an attacker gets hold of a database that has clear text passwords in it, then you are in big trouble. Why is that, actually? There's another very, very common user behavior, because it's like, so what? I hack into Quora, I get your Quora password. Why does this? Yeah, because you guys are dumb. You guys reuse that password all over the place, right? You come up with one good password that you can remember, and you, then you, you know, use it for your bank. And then you get to Quora and you're like, well, I already have a password, I'll just use that same password. Um, and so um, if I find out your email address or some sort of username and a password, it's likely that I can probably try that on a bunch of other sites where there is sensitive information. Because again, who cares if they can log into you as Quora? What are they gonna do? They're gonna put some stupid answers to questions and make you look bad? Okay, fine, right? Um, but a lot of times people reuse that same password across multiple sites, so that's why this is so valuable. So instead of storing the clear text passwords, what a site will do is it'll store a hash of the password. And so the login process works as follows. When you log in, um, I take your password, I hash it, and then I compare it with the hash that I have stored in my database. If the two are the same, your login request is accepted. If they're not, um, it's, it's not. And so if someone steals my database, they don't have the original passwords, what they have are hashes of the passwords. And so to recover the original passwords, I would have to somehow find a way to take the hash value and recover the original input. But remember that one of the properties for a cryptographic hash function is that this is supposed to be in impossible. Okay. So there's, there, you know, this sounds great, right? And then you might think, you know, if this is true, why are they bothering me about all this 2FA stuff, right? Um, you know, this works. Um, and there are some best practices that you can do with this. Um, so I'm gonna point you, this is probably one of my favorite tech articles of all time. This is a really, really good piece in Ars Technica about a hack of a company called H.B. Gary. So H.B. Gary was a security contractor um, that made the mistake of ticking off Anonymous, the sort of shadowy hacker collective. Um, and Anonymous, uh, over a period of several days, managed to break into H.P. Gary's site, and eventually did things like publish all of their email from the last, like, 10 years or something like that. Um, and so this is a great story about how to breach security, and it also points out a bunch of cases where this company was not following security best practices. Um, so for example, if, so if we go, if we go back to this, um, our, our series of assumptions here, if someone steals the database, they have the hashes of the passwords. If your passwords are random strings, it will take them forever to figure out what the hashes are. So that's very secure. The problem is, again, you guys are dumb. You don't pick random strings for your password. You pick, like, password, password one, password two, right? You pick combinations of dictionary words, and so the the space of potential passwords that users actually use is much, much, much smaller. So if I had to guess a random string and hash it to find your password, it would take a long time. But if users pick weak passwords, then the amount of time it can take just to guess what your password is, compute the hash, and compare it with this database I have of uh, hashed passwords and find a match is much, much smaller. So this is actually one of the reasons why it's so important to pick strong passwords, because when you pick weak passwords, you've made it much, much easier for an attacker to figure out what your password is if they can, they can hack into a site and find the hashes of the password, right? So that was one of the things that H.P. Geary did. One of the things I want to point out very strongly is I'm in no way condoning the actions of Anonymous in this particular case. Um, but it's a great article. It's very interesting what happened. And it's a good thing to read, give you a sense of, you know, introduce you to computer security, um, and also help you avoid some of the same mistakes. Because essentially, um, it's, this particular um, attack 
used a bunch of different techniques all kind of together, one after another. And so it's also an interesting example of how hackers will try to attack companies, right? Using, a, you know, there was an, uh, something called an SQL injection attack, there was a password-based attack, there was a social engineering attack, um, there were lunch, a bunch of different pieces of this, this hack um, that relied on flaws in the security system that eventually allowed the whole thing to succeed. So this is a really, really great read. Don't read it now in class, read it later. All right. So let me talk, so this is sort of where we left off last time. Let me talk about another example of where hashing is used in an interesting way, and that's in blockchain. So the, the blockchain, the idea behind blockchain is that I'm, the, the blockchain itself is linked through cryptographic hashes. And the way that we, the, the blockchain is secured uses this old idea that goes back to something called Hashcash. And so here's, here was the general idea behind Hashcash. If I give you a hash value of a particular size, I can estimate how much work you have to do to find an input that produces that hash. So I'm giving you a hash value, and I'm saying, find me an input that produces that value. Because the hash function is essentially randomly distributed over the output, you have to sit there guessing different inputs over and over again until you find an input that produces the correct hash value. So given the size of the hash, I can estimate with pretty good confidence how many different inputs you'll have to check, and so how much work you'll have to do. And so I can force you to do a certain amount of computation. That's what's critical about this. I have a way to force you to do a certain amount of computation. And the thing that's really cool about this is that it's very easy to, for me to check the result. So again, I say, I want you to, you know, find an input that produces this hash value. You go off and you do a bunch of work. When you're done, you come to me with some input. All I have to do to, is hash it and check whether or not it matches the value that I asked you to produce. If it does, then I know that you've done a certain amount of computational work. This is actually a really cool idea. I can very easily set up a challenge that forces you to consume a bunch of computer cycles, and I can very easily validate that you did that. The original use of Hashcash was supposed to be for fighting spam. So one of the things that makes spam possible is that it's really easy to send email. I can just write a little program that sends billions of emails over the course of a couple of hours. So the idea here was if I made it harder to send emails, then it would be less likely that people would send these spammy emails, because you might think, like, who clicks on the links in a spam message? You know, other than, like, your stupid relative who always talks about how they've been hacked and, you know, they have another computer virus, right? But that's the idea. You know, if, even if, like, even if the click-through rate on a spam message is, like, one in 100,000, it's so cheap to send mail that it still can be profitable to send these sort of stupid spammy messages. So what if, what if I make it more expensive to send mail? Then the idea is the number of spam messages is gonna go down. So here's an example of how this works. So, so Alice will say to Bob, you know, uh, find an input that produces this hash. Now this is actually really hard. We would never, like you would never do something this hard because this is a huge, this is a very, very large hash and it's a very specific value. I'll talk in the middle about how blockchain does this. This is not how blockchain does this. Asking you for a specific value for like a 160-bit hash function like this would force you to do a massive amount of work, right? Um, but then Bob would go off, try a bunch of inputs, um, and finally, after, in this case, a long time, like years, would come back and say to Alice, okay, I have an input now that produces this hash. And again, so Bob's had to go and do a bunch of work trying all these different random inputs, but all Alice has to do to check is hash that one input and make sure that it matches. So I can force Bob, Alice can force Bob to do an arbitrary amount of work, but very, very quickly validate that Bob actually did the work. Unless Bob can invert this hash function, and right now there are no known ways to do this for the popular widely used hash functions, unless Bob can do that, he cannot solve this challenge other than trying a bunch and bunch and bunch of inputs. So again, this is really, really kind of a cool idea. I can force Bob to do a lot of work. I can very, very easily validate that Bob did the work. 
The way this plays out in blockchain is this por portion of the protocol called proof of work. And so, let's see down here. This is in, so this talks a little bit about Hashcash. Um, and so how this is done in blockchain is rather than having to hit a specific hash value, because that is way too hard with a good hash function that produces a large output. What blockchain does is it says, you have to take an existing piece of data, add some random data to it, and produce a hash value below a certain threshold. So I give you an arbitrary threshold, and you have to conti continue to try to find random data that you can add to the original data that's gonna go into the chain until you find a value that produces a hash below a certain threshold. Once you do, that addition to the chain is accepted and added. That threshold is adjusted. So, you know, when uh, blockchain started, it was higher, um, which meant it made it easier to solve the challenge. And as time goes on, as computers are getting faster, what's happening is that threshold is dropping because the design of blockchain is intended to make it take about 10 minutes worth of computer time to solve this challenge. And so as time goes on, computers get faster, the threshold goes down. So essentially, I'm asking you to produce a more and more and more specific hash value as time goes on. But again, I don't ask you for a specific hash value, that would be too hard. Instead, I ask you for a value within a range. Any questions about this? This is pretty, this is pretty cool stuff. Oh, and then, so part of it, so you might wonder why. Why am I doing this, right? So part of the idea here is that because it takes so much computation to add information to the blockchain, if I want to, if, if an attacker wanted to modify something in the blockchain, if they wanted to change a transaction, they would have to redo a lot of the hashes for the rest of the chain. And so the amount of work they would have to do to do that is enormous. So it's not feasible to modify the blockchain in that way. Right? This is one of the things that keeps the, this distributed ledger secure, is the amount of extra work I would have to do. If I wanted to change one bit, let's say I wanted to you know, claim retroactively that you were supposed to transfer more Bitcoin to me than you actually did, changing that one bit requires recomputing the hashes for a bunch of, bu of, of the blocks in the chain. Doing that takes a huge amount of time. And so uh, the idea is that an attacker doesn't have that much time at their disposal. All right, this is, you know, also, I, I don't know, I, I guess the, um, I think some of the fear, uncertainty, and doubt about this has started to subside, but um, the amount of energy that's used for Bitcoin mining is kind of insane. Uh, it's, a, it's a little bit stupid. I've, there were some articles maybe three or four months ago about how in certain um, industrial towns now in various parts in the Midwest, that are, for example, located close to a dam or some cheap source of electricity, um, Bitcoin miners have gone in and set up these like data centers inside an old factory. Um, and you know the way that the locals find out about this is that their energy rates suddenly start to skyrocket because power around there has been cheap for a long time because you live right next to the dam, and you know energy is is plentiful. And then suddenly these Bitcoin miners start to come in because the power is cheap and you get a bill from a utility company that's two or three times what you're used to paying. Right? So, so anyway, I, I'm not gonna comment on the social impact of this, but it's an interesting issue. Any questions about hashing, any of this stuff before we switch gears? Okay, cool. Oh, yeah, final note about this, because this is, this, is, this is neat. This sort of brings us full circle. So in computer science, this, this sort of function has a very specific name. It's called a one-way function. A function that is easy to compute on every input, but hard to invert on any output. That is a, that's our definition of a cryptographic hash function. Relatively easy to, to compute, but essentially Im almost impossible to invert. I can't take the output value and easily figure out what input you gave me. No one has been able to prove that these functions exist. We have functions that seem to act in this way, but no one has ever been able to prove, for example, that there's no way to invert a value produced by SHA-1 or SHA-2 or any of these hash functions. If you could prove that, 
then one of the results of this would be that you would have proven that P and NP are not equal. So this, the existence of this functions has this deep connection to the most important theoretical problem in the field, which is kind of cool. So on some, it, it's sort of interesting where we are right now. Maybe you guys will live to see this change. But right now, a lot of the sec computer security in the world rests on conjecture. We haven't been able to prove that some of these things are true, but pretty much the entire world economy, all of the security systems that your bank uses, that, you know, uh, governments use to secure their communications, are all, you know, fundamentally rest on a, you know, more and more firm as time goes by, but still theoretically unsound foundation, right? No one has been able to prove that some of these things are true, but we rely on them all the time. So again, if you could invert SHA-1 or any of these hash functions, you could essentially mount incredibly damaging attacks on the world's, uh, you know, security infrastructure. You could get a, because you could go to a site, you could hack in, you could get passwords, you could basically just invert them, all of them. You'd have the, the plain text passwords, and then off you go. All right, any questions about this topic before we move on? You guys will see. I have another chance, I think, to write some of your own hash functions and work again with hashing in 225 when we get there. Okay, so let's shift gears a little bit and let's talk about generics. So we've introduced generics in the past from the perspective of a user. We showed you, um, you know, list and maps. At this point, you've, you've uh, been starting to work with both of these data structures. If you combine both of these data structures, you can pretty much solve most problems in computer science. And normally when you're using these, you're using Java's built-in implementations. So here I have an example where I'm creating two lists, and I'm using a list type for my reference variable, but on the right side I have several different implementations of a list, and I'm doing the same thing with a map. So map, again, is an interface type in Java. It can be implemented by multiple different classes, and there are multiple different implementations of it that are already available in the Java standard library. So I have a hash map, which is what I typically use, and then there's something called a tree map as well. Um, a hash map, I suspect, I strongly suspect uses hashes to implement a map, and a tree map, I would also strongly suspect uses some sort of tree-like data structure uh, to implement the map. But they both implement the same interface. So in the past, we've talked about the fact that, you know, the nice thing about these data structures is that they, you can put any type of Java object into them. So a list in Java will store any type of Java object. A map allows you to map any type of Java object to any other type of Java object. But doing this without using the generic system comes at the cost of safety. So for example, here I have a map. Um, I, sorry, here I'm creating a list. I put a string into it. But when I get the value out of the list, what comes out is not a string anymore, it's an object. And so I would have to do a downcast here. So if I try to compile this code, you're gonna see it's not gonna compile because it says I can't convert an object to a string. So if I wanna do this, I can explicitly downcast the object and I have to do this here too. Map has the same problem. So I can put these explicit downcasts into my code, but that's gonna fail if what's inside the list isn't a string. So let's say I add an integer to my list. Worse still, now I have an, a runtime fault. This is a class cast exception. So this doesn't happen when I compile the code, so I can ship this to the customer and think that it works fine. But I didn't realize that in certain cases, you know, that code that was written by that other part of the company took my list that I was, I, I put it in the documentation. This list should only contain strings. They didn't read the documentation, and they put integers into it in certain cases. And I didn't catch them in my test suite, and now this crashes when the, the customer tries to run it, which is terrible. Okay, so, so we've already seen this weakness, and we've already seen how to overcome it in Java. Um, and the reason this is so important goes back again to something we talked about earlier in the semester, which is that runtime errors are awful. We want to avoid them at all costs. We want to do as much when we compile our code, when we compile our Java source code into bytecode, to find problems like this so that they don't 
come up when the code is executed. So I want to try to convert compile time errors to runtime errors. That's because I compile the code before I ship it, so I can fix problems at that point. Um, if I don't fix those problems, um, or if I don't fix those uh, runtime errors, they, they will bite you, right? They will come up, and there'll be some weird crash, and you won't be able to figure out what happened, right? So, the, you know, one of the, you know, again, one of the cool things in modern language design when you look at newer languages is, as computers have gotten faster, compilers are getting faster, compilers are doing more for you. They're doing more work when you compile the code to check various things about your program. There's a whole research community that studies this stuff. Um, you know, so, so compile time, you know, investigation of your code is doing more and more to catch potential bugs and to force you, as the programmer, to fix things so that they don't cause problems later. In Java, the system that we used to do this is called generics. And so we've already seen this here. Um, this is the syntax for using a class that supports uh, generics, that supports being generified, I guess, is how you talk about it. So here, I'm not creating a list of any type of Java object. I'm telling the compiler, through this annotation here in angle brackets, that this list is gonna contain integers. Down here, I'm telling the compiler that this map is gonna map integer keys to string values. Then, when the code is compiled, the compiler is gonna check for me and make sure that any time I put something into my integer list, it is, in fact, an integer, or something that can be upcasted to an integer. Same thing with my map. Any time I add a, add a mapping to this map, the compiler is gonna be able to check for me and make sure that the key is an integer and the value is a string. So this is the way that I you know, create these um, in Java. As of Java 9, I think you can use this syntax over here, which is called the diamond operator. All that does is copy over the type parameters from the left side. So this is equivalent to new array list, open triangle bracket, integer, close triangle bracket, same. It's just a convenience. The reason why Java has this feature, I just wanna emphasize this, is because we wanna combine these two really desirable properties of Java. Right? The first one is polymorphism. So because every object in Java can act like a Java capital O object, it's really easy to build these general purpose data structures. So I can build a list that stores every type of Java object. And I can create operations on that list, like search, because every Java object supports equals. Same thing with maps. I can create a general purpose class that maps any Java object to any other Java object. We did that last time in class. It was quite simple. The reason for that is any Java object supports hash code. So these are really, really desirable features. However, I also want to preserve the type checking that Java does for me. You know, Java is a strongly typed language that distinguishes it from things like JavaScript and Python, where, you know, the lack of a type system or of a strong type system can produce more runtime errors. Remember, our goal is to, uh, you know, uh, move runtime errors to compile time. Adding types to my uh, objects allows me to do that better. So I don't want to lose the type system in order to gain this generality. You know, just because my list stores objects doesn't mean that I should only have a list that operates only on objects. I still want to be able to tell the compiler, this list should only contain integers. This list should only contain numbers, whatever. Okay. So generics are allowed to, tr to try to allow us to have the best of both worlds. So I'm gonna provide type information for the compiler, but my generic classes are still gonna be completely general. All right, so here's, um, I'm trying to remember about, Oh, this is just an example of, you know, what, what happens when I actually add these type annotations, right? So now, because I've told the compiler that this list stores strings, when I try to add an integer to it, it's gonna fail. At compile time, right? This is really important. This is a compilation error. So even if I fix this, now let's go down here and look at my map, same thing. I've told the compiler this map should store mappings from strings to integers. When I get down here to line 22 and I try to put a mapping into the map that isn't from a string to an integer, it's from an integer to another integer, 
it fails at compile time. Before these were runtime, these would potentially cause runtime errors. Now I can catch them when I compile the code and make sure this doesn't happen. Okay, so I'll come back to that in a minute. So how do we generify our classes? So we have, we've talked about how to use this, but let's talk about how this actually works. How do you design a generic Java class? All right, so there's some new syntax that we're gonna introduce. So the first thing I have to do is declare our class to accept type parameters. So here's an example. This is new syntax. I don't think I'm gonna actually get through all of Java's syntax. Maybe, well, we're gonna get really close, actually, after Monday's lecture. So here's the new bit. You see this? You guys have seen this before, public class. I'm declaring a new class called simple length list. This is new. This is a type parameter. They come in angle brackets following the class declaration. Once I declare a type parameter, I can use that type parameter throughout my class. So my method get now doesn't return a particular type or an object, it returns an instance of type E, where E is the parameter that was passed to this class. Same thing here. My set function takes an index. This is a simple linked list, so I'm gonna, the index is still an int, but the second argument is a reference variable of the type that the class was parameterized with. Okay, so this is, this is our new syntax. One of the things that's important to understand is that these are parameters, not variables. So I can't, I can use my type parameters in most places, almost all places where I would normally provide a type. There are some gotchas with the Java generic system that I'll get to in a few slides. But I can't do something like this. This doesn't make any sense. This is not a, a variable that I can set um, and, and use like a variable, it's a parameter. One way to think about how this works is to imagine that the compiler, when it compiles your code, anytime somebody creates an instance of your class and provides a type parameter, the compiler replaces all instance of the parameter with the type that's used. So here's an example. I have a class list that is gonna store elements of type E. That's a parameter to the class. Here I've created a list that's gonna store string. So this is sort of like I had the following code. Here's a list, I've removed the type parameter, and everywhere that the type parameter appeared, I've replaced it with the actual type, the concrete type that was used. Here's another example. Let's say I create a list of integers that I'm taking my list again with type parameter E. Everywhere I see E, I replace it with integer. Okay? Now this is not, I, I wanna defend myself in case anybody sees this and gets angry. This is not what happens. So what happens actually when the code is compiled is much more complicated than this. The compiler only creates one instance of every generic class. And the type information that's used when the program is compiled to check to make sure that those classes are being used properly is erased. So what actually happens during compilation is something that's called type erasure. So eventually what I end up with is a list class that essentially operates on objects, okay? Um, but this is not a bad mental model to think about how type parameters work. Just think about that parameter E being replaced everywhere throughout the class with whatever concrete type was provided when the instance of the class was created. So, so there are actually languages that uh, support a generic type system this way. Java does not, right? Java essentially says, I'm gonna create one instance of list that operates on objects after I've compiled the code and I've used that type information to check to make sure that the uh, instances of those classes are being used safely. Classes can take multiple type parameters. So here's an example. Um, I have a simple linked list that takes a single type parameter of type E. But let's say I have a map. Remember, maps in Java map one Java object to any other Java object. So here I'm gonna use two type parameters in my angle brackets, K and B. You might guess what these would stand for, right? K is the type of my key. B is the type of my value. And so again, now I could write a class that get returns put takes as a first argument, you know, something of type K, 
second argument, something of type B. We'll see examples of this in a minute. You can actually call these type parameters anything you want. But Java has set up some conventions for naming them that are important to understand because you'll see them in documentation. So here are the rules. By convention, again, these are not rules. The compiler will not enforce these rules. But if you want to write idiomatic, sophisticated Java code, here's what you do. Your type parameters are single capital letters. This is like the one place, if you're one of those people that's really upset because I've been encouraging you to use good descriptive variable names throughout the class, here's your one place where you can use a single character variable name, right? Feel good about yourself. Um, single case upper, single uppercase letters. So you'll see T, K, V, N, E, et cetera. Again, this is just a convention. There's no rules about this. If you want to call your type parameter value, fine, right? But this is done for a reason, mainly because I'm trying, th what you're trying to do is make sure that you don't confuse your type parameters with either variable names or class names. Class names in Java are capitalized, but are typically more than one letter. Variable names in Java are typically start with the lowercase letter. So by choosing a single uppercase letter, uh, my type parameters can be distinguished from these other, um, other uh, tokens that I'm gonna see in my code, other words I'm gonna see in my code. In addition to this, certain type parameters have conventional meanings. So E is for an element, like an element in a list. K is for key and V is for value. So you see these in the map interface type. We use this for our maps. N is for a number, so Java has a number class of which integer and double are descendants, um, et cetera. So let's look at how this works for a map. Again, I'm gonna show you again this, prop, th this uh, type uh, replacement just for your mental model. So here's my map that's parameterized to use K and V. My get function now returns a reference of type V. It returns a reference of type value, and it accepts a reference of type K, where K is the key. My put takes as a first parameter a, a reference of type K, and as a second parameter, a reference of type V. When I instantiate a map that maps from string to doubles, it's almost equivalent to this. So if I had created a class that mapped from strings to doubles, returned a double, took a string to a double, and I just created an instance of this class, right? One more example, so integer to string looks like this. So now in this case, integers are the keys, strings are the values. So when I, my get returns a string because that's the value type, my put takes an integer as a key and a string as the value because integer is the key type, string is the value type. Okay. So let's, let's use these, right? So let's do an example. Actually, any questions at this point about the syntax? This is gonna turn out to not as, be as bad as you might think. We'll, we'll go through an example here, and it's actually somewhat uh, easier than you might think to add these to your existing classes. Yeah. Let me get there. Actually, we're not gonna talk about super or, ex uh, we'll, we'll talk about extent, right? Um, so the question is about type uh, bounded types, right? And I'll, and I'll get there in a minute, right? We're gonna, we'll do a, we'll do one example uh, with the type query, but let's do something with just the raw types first and simpler. Okay, so here is this, this is the full implementation of our simple linked list class. It's also a great review, right? Um, I've added all the methods. You guys had added a series of these on the homework problems, but this is the full implementation. Uh, it works, which is good. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna change this. So right now, this is not a generic class. It operates on raw Java objects. So I wanna fix that. I wanna turn this into a generified version of a list that allows the caller to provide type parameters so that it can be used safely. Okay, so the first thing to do when, when, when you approach a problem like this is think about what type do I want to parameterize? In this case, it's the values that I store in the list. Right now, if you look here at my item inner class, the value is of type object. If I look at 
um, my constructor takes an array of objects. If I look at my add method, it takes an object. So again, this is the class that I want to replace with my class, my type parameter. So this is the type I want to replace. This is working right now because all of, uh, the, when, when I call these methods, whatever I pass is being upcast to an object, and I can do that in Java with any object, because every object descends from capital O object. But I want to rewrite this so it's safer, so I can tell the compiler I'm using this list to store integers. If you try to put a string into it, please tell me, if, if, if I try to put a string into it, or anybody else does, please tell me when I try to compile the code that the list is being used incorrectly. Okay, so the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add my type parameter to the class declaration. I'm gonna use the name E following the Java conventions. E is an element in a collection or a list. And then I have to go through and find all the cases where I've used object, and now I wanna use that type. So my item inner class should now um, store an instance of E not of a generic object, and the constructor has to be, uh, modified as well. My simple linked list constructor that takes an array should no longer take an array of object references. Again, I don't want to do that, so it's not safe. Instead, I'm gonna force it to take an array of references of type E, whatever the class is parameterized to. Down here, uh, my remove method returns something of type E, so I'm gonna, uh, replace that as well. Um, let's see here. My get method should return something of type E. My set method should take that as an argument. Get item as internal, I don't think that needs to do anything, anything different than that. Oh, I should do this too, right? Because whatever I return, I can use this inside methods as well. So whatever I return in this method should be the type that the class was parameterized with. Just check and make sure that I've done this properly. Oh wait, add, sorry. So add should also take not a general object, but an object of type E, whatever element type I've used when I create the parameterized class. So let's try running this and see what happens. Ah, okay, so. I have a compiler error. The compiler error is on 30, line 39. Let me try to hunt this down. Okay. Ah. So this is actually interesting. This is an example of how generics can actually help me with my own code. So there's a bug here in the code that I provided for the linked list implementation. This bug was not visible until I added this type parameter. What's the problem? Can anybody see it? Why am I getting this error on this line? How do I fix this? Maybe that's a better question. Kai, did you have an answer? Sorry, I'm, I'm calling on somebody in, in a little bit farther forward. Yeah, so I'm returning an, I'm, I'm accidentally returning an item here. I'm setting to return to start. Start is a reference to an item. What I should be doing is returning start.value. Why did this work before? It worked before because item is an object, and therefore it descends from object. And so I could return it from this method without a problem. So you can see that this is actually helping me find bugs in my own code, because now the compiler knows, hey, wait. You said that remove is supposed to return something of type E, but you're returning something of type object. Right, this is the problem. I think there's gonna be one more bug for us to fix. I'll just go ahead and grab it, it's right here. Same problem. Now it works again. Okay. So, we've created our first parameterized class. Now note, right now, the code down here that's running my main method is not using the type parameterization feature. 
you can do this in Java. You can take a parameterized class and you can use it without providing a type parameter. When you do this, your code will run, but you will get warnings from the compiler. This is the warning you guys have seen on some of the homework problems about performing an unchecked or unsafe operation. Because the compiler is saying, look, this class provides you with the ability to check to make sure that you're using it properly. You're not using that because you haven't provided a type parameter. You haven't told the compiler what kind of object you're gonna put in there. So let's fix that. So now I can modify the declaration of my simple linked list to tell Java, I'm using this list to store integers. So I add the integer declaration to the left side, and then I add the, the um, diamond operator. So far, this works exactly the way I would expect. But what's new is that now if I try to add a string, I get a compiler error. Right? I can't convert a string to an integer, and I've told the compiler that this list is going to be used to store integers. If I take off this type declaration, I, I've got no problem. Right? Questions about this? Yeah, so the question is, why would I move the bracket when it works? So <laughs> one way to think about this is that when you don't provide a type annotation, you're kind of saying this. You're essentially telling Java, I'm creating a simple linked list that can store any type of object. And so at this point, I can put integers into it, I can put strings into it, I can put anything. This will still work. In this case, for this particular example, what I'm imagining is that you don't want to store strings in this list. You want to use this list to store integers. And so by adding this annotation, you're telling the compiler, I am going to use this list to store integers. Then what the compiler can do is that it can check this call on line 93. It says, okay, I see that you're calling add. You've told me that the simple linked list is used to store integers. And so I check the declaration of add that we provided up here in our class. Where is it? Here it is. Add takes as its first parameter an integer, and as its second parameter, something of type E, whatever the class was parameterized with. So you told the compiler that this list was used to store integers, and the class told the compiler that if the, the class is parameterized to store integers, then the second argument to add should also be an integer. And so when it looks at this code on line 93, it says, okay, I'm calling add. Is the first argument an integer? It is, so that's okay. Is the second argument an integer? No. And that's how it fails. That makes sense? Other questions about this? All right, I'm almost out of time, so I'm gonna come back to some of this on Friday. We have a couple other things I wanna cover with generics, but let me um, just say a few things about the midterm. So the, f the final midterm starts on Saturday um, in the CB tap. It's gonna run from Saturday to Monday. This is, um, you know, the focus again is on data structures and algorithms. The, the material will test all of the programming abilities that you've built up throughout the semester. Um, there are four programming problems that are together worth 60 points. All the ones I've written so far have partial credit opportunities. Um, this represents, you know, this is the last assessment. This represents the most sophisticated programming task you guys have done so far. Um, the way to, yes, and again, my, my goal is to drive down the course evaluations by pissing you off right before the, right before we do the forms. Um, all right, so as always, the best way to prepare for the midterm is to do the practice homework problems. And so to make this even more clear, let me point out something. There's a question on lists on the exam. It is very, very similar to one of the questions on lists on the homework. 
There's a question on trees on the exam. It is very, very similar to one of the questions on trees on the homework. There's a question on sorting. It's exactly the same as one of the homework problems on sorting. Right? Again, I mean, there's only so many sorting problems you can write. And then there's one last question that I will hold details of to myself. As you guys are packing up, let me talk a little bit about what we're gonna do for the next couple classes. Um, so on Friday, we'll wrap up generics, and then I'll introduce you to concurrency. We'll talk a little bit about hardware. Um, Monday. So Monday's class is kind of interesting in the sense that um, the last midterm has already started. So clearly the material on Monday's class can't be on the midterm. We'll talk about some cool Java features, including streams and some functional Java programming idioms. Then on Wednesdays, we're gonna wrap up. We'll do the ISIS forms in class that day. So good luck on your final project. Good luck on today's uh, quiz. Good luck on the midterm that's coming up. I do not have office hours today. I have a little bit of a cold. I don't want to infect anybody, so I'm gonna go home. Um, I will see you guys on Friday.